it's going to be a talk about what FS coaching is and what it's all about. But really, I'm hoping to share the realities of FS coaching, but also inspire people to become FS coaches. And um, people who already know me will know how passionate I am about coaching people and how passionate I am about getting more, not just only more number of coaches in British skydiving, but a higher quality of um, coaching. Because the better coaching people get, the better the skydivers uh, long term. So I'm hoping that comes um, across. So a little bit about me. So my name's Catherine Leather. So I've been an FS coach for the last five years. But for the last nearly three years, I've also been teaching people to become coaches, which is loads of fun. Um, I'm an IBA tunnel coach as well. Um, and when I'm not doing that, um, I spend the majority of my time doing four-way. So I'm part of um, Team Meraki, so this is my team here. If any of you are going to nationals, you'll get to see us. Um, and I hope we've got some people in this room going there, because that should be loads of fun. Okay, so with the coaching role, <laughs> I think the coaching role is the best job on the drop zone, okay? AFF instructors also have a very cool job because they get people... Sorry, apologies. Okay. <laughs> they get people, obviously, to be able to jump out of an aircraft and save their own life. But I do something even better than that because I get them to a point where they can go and jump with their friends. And what's cooler than jumping with their friends? So I just think it is the best job um, on the drop zone, in my opinion. Um, who in here can remember their FS coach? Yeah, literally everyone. How amazing is that? No matter how many jumps you end up with, you're gonna remember your FS coach, and I also love that as well. Um, so, FS coaching, well, coaching in general, um, isn't always a nice experience. There can be good experience and bad experiences for the coach and also for the person who's being coached. So, when I think back to the coaching that I've received, I've had some coaches where I've had a really good coaching experience and I've had some coaches where I've had a really bad um, coaching experience and it just hasn't really suited me. So good experiences, um, where it's been really good for me is where the coach has made me feel really good about myself. They've used positive language, they've made me feel like I'm progressing um, and I've really come out thinking like I've really achieved something. I've also experienced some bad coaching, or coaching that wasn't for me, should we say. And sometimes coaches um, have used really negative language, they've made me feel like uh, worthless, like I can't progress, and literally made me feel rubbish. And, I, and that's something that I never want any of my students um, to feel like. Has anyone um, got any really good coaching experiences that they've had somebody coaching them that they want to share? I might be surprised if you do. No, go on. Uh, howdy. Uh, with my FS coach, Matt Cumming, he was just brilliant yeah. throughout the whole day. Uh, even more so because he was coaching two other people at the same day, and I nearly got my FS1 in one day. And it was uh, <coughs> remarkable, two days. Um, and it was just brilliant. Yeah, so I can definitely see why it would be an amazing job. Perfect. Thank you. Well done, Matt. He is a good coach as well. And has anyone got any um, experiences that weren't so well? that they want to share. That's always a tough one. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I have had some coaches that um, it hasn't worked for me, and it's not necessarily that they've been a bad coach, it's just that either the language that they've used has been maybe slightly too negative for me, it's not been as encouraging. And actually sometimes it's just that the personalities don't click. It's just like anything in life. You'll find a coach that you really get on with and, and want to work well with, and other personalities that just don't suit. There's no right or wrong um, answer, but it's just, if you're wanting to become a coach, something to really bear in mind. Have we got anyone in here that's currently working towards being a coach? Yes, oh, quite a few, yes. And is there anyone that has recently got the coaches rating? Like in the last 12 months? No. Oh, you guys that are working towards it, then we need to really get you your, uh, your coaches rating. Okay, so. Just some of the more serious side of it before we get into the realities of um, coaching. So um, with coaching, we should never attempt to take on the role of an instructor. Um, instructors such as AFF instructors, they operate with a different criteria um, to FS coaches, and that should always bear in mind. You should always bear that in mind. The, we'll call them a student in inverted commas, and um, that you're going to be taking up. 
they're responsible for themselves. They've already got an A licence. They've already shown that they can save their own life. You are in no way uh, responsible for them deploying their canopy, although there is some safety stuff that we will come back on to. Um, and you should never try to change their emergency pr procedures. It's good if you see them practising it, and if there's anything that you think that doesn't look right, that's the time that we hand it back to an instructor. Um, sometimes, um, depending where they've been taught, they might have different wordings that they use, um, but if there's something like if they're doing something out of order or whatever, uh, hand it back to an instructor. Um, and again, like I said, we're not responsible for their deployment, but if there's something going wrong even at that point, again, you need to be referring back to an instructor. And then, lastly, if you decide you want to become a coach, currently under British Skydiving, in order to get your coaches rating, you need to have a minimum of 200 descents and two hours of free fall t time. You must have been involved in skydiving for at least two years, and you need to be um, familiar with the current British Skydiving FS manuals, which are available online. And you either need to be a category system basic instructor, already attended a Sports Coach UK course um, on coaching methods and communication, um, or you've got a teaching on co coaching qualification, or you've had a methods of instruction lecture given by a British Skydiving advanced instructor or the military uh, methods of instruction. You can normally get that at your drop zone from an advanced instructor. Okay, so let's get on to a bit more of an interesting bit. So I just wanted to share with you why I became a coach um, and hopefully inspire some of you to become coaches as well. So this picture here, um, I was really fortunate enough back in, I don't know if that was 2000, 14 maybe. Uh, actually, Renata is in the room as well, who's on this uh, photo. Do you know when that was? Four, 2014, 15, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, the drop zone that I was at, I was really fortunate that British Skydiving sent an FS roadshow to our drop zone. And um, on here we've got Kate Lindsley, uh, Renata and Raf. And this was the first time I'd been around anybody who could properly fly belly, shall we say. And I was so inspired by them on this day. I paid for them to jump with me, so I did a jump with the three coaches, and I have a picture of that jump on my wall in my study, and I look at it every day, because that is um, the reason. One, I wanted to become a coach because of how they had handled me and other students during that day, and also it's what got me into four-way, <laughs> so it's partly my master's fault. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so basically from that day I got obsessed with it. So first of all I wanted to become better for myself and then I wanted to get on the road to being a coach. Kate Lindsay, who's on the side here, basically she helped me massively. She at the time obviously was already a coach and she allowed me to watch her briefs, debriefs. I literally followed her around for several years. Um, and now I'm lucky enough to be able to call her my teammate, so it's, it's worked out great. But she massively helped me and she gave me the confidence to go ahead with it. Since um, 2017, I then started to get a bit more personal coaching for myself. So my coach here is Dennis Pryor from the Hi Hayabusa, who are cur current and multiple world champions. I'm super fortunate that I've managed to spend a lot of time um, with Dennis and his teammates. What he did for me is he's not only helped me with my own flying, but he helped me to become a coach. And even now, he still helps me with my coaching. So what, what I would do is I'd go over to Belgium where they live, um, spend quite a lot of time over there, fly with them to help me, but I'd be listening to everything they said to everybody. So I would be picking up how they handled um, maybe tough, decision, uh, tough discussions, sorry, um, handled how to explain things, and then also, he then started to allow me to help him coach. So he would say to me, what am I looking out for here? What should I say to this person? What should I say to this four-way? Whatever it was. Um, and then he'd tell me if I was looking at the right thing or not. Or he'd tell me things to consider. It's great that I've managed to do that. And I know how lucky I am to have um, been able to have that that experience. But the good thing about that is I've literally sucked every ounce of knowledge that I could from them boys and I now share that with everybody who I come across um, and in all the, the manuals and everything we use for our drop zone. Um, 
I now do that for other people too. So if people are wanting to become a coach, they're more than welcome to come and listen to me, to follow me around, to listen to what I'm saying, and me help them brief and debrief. But it's only because I came across these people and they inspired me so much that that's why I'm so passionate about it now. And if I can just get one person in this room to get that inspired and become a coach, I'll be super happy that I did this um, presentation. So let's get into the realities of it. So what people think FS coaching is, so this is some things I've heard around the drop zone. So people sometimes think it's a good way to get free jumps. In some ways it is, because most drop zones will pay for your jump. However, if that's the only reason you're doing it to get your jump numbers up, please don't, please don't coach. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. People think it's really basic and anyone can do it. If you think about FS coaching uh, for FS1, yes, we're teaching basic movements, but it isn't simple to teach basic movements. People think it's not hard. It is really hard. There's a million things to consider, which we'll come on to. And some people think that the only signals you need to give are arch and legs out, because apparently that fixes everything. It does not fix everything, okay? Um, what it actually is, it's really hard work for a free jump. I can't be bothered getting a free jump with the amount of work I pay for it. That's not why I'm doing it. It's just not worth the, the time. It can be hard work to stay current as well. Um, like I said, I'm really fortunate with the people that I still learn off because I'm getting the most up-to-date techniques. Um, sometimes people will become coaches and then that's it. They stay with techniques for years and years and years and they don't develop themselves. So it can be hard to, t to keep on top of actually what's the, what's the most efficient way to fly uh, these days. Not everyone can do it. So you could be the best flyer in this room by far, but that doesn't mean you can be a good coach. Just because you can fly doesn't mean you can explain how you do it, first of all. And then secondly, doesn't mean you can teach somebody how to do it. I mentioned teaching ba basic moves is tricky. It really is. And one thing that I think people don't consider when they come to start learning to be a coach is how hard it is to give signals in the air and also seeing what is wrong with the jump or how to fix something. When I first um, start people on the road to be coaches, you see a lot of this going on in the camera. Because when you do that, um, even that even, to on a camera or to a student in free fall at 120 mile an hour, it looks like that. They, do, they can't see what, you, what you're saying. And people try to talk to students as well in the sky, which also doesn't work. And again, um, depends on where you jump, you're going to get up to 60 seconds in free fall. It's super hard in that time to think about what the jump is we're doing, communicating with someone, and then actually picking up what they need to change in that moment to make the skydive better. Now, at the drop zone where we are, are at, we would prefer it if you can fix something in the sky so that by the time they land, we've already had an improvement in that jump. And the reason why is because um, it's quite expensive for them to do a coach jump at the drop zone where I am. There's nothing wrong with if you can't fix it there and then, as long as if you see it and you know how to explain it so that the next jump, uh, we see an improvement. Um, what it definitely isn't, is it's definitely not signing someone off as the best skydiver in the world. They just basically need to um, present to us that they can do some basic movements, forwards, backwards, small turns, slides, swoop to pin, three-way, four-way. You're not signing them off to say they're going to be the next four-way champion. We're just basically signing them off to say they're safe enough to go and jump with the friends. It's not always about belly either, okay? Not everyone is getting their FS1 because they want to go on big ways or they want to get into four-way. Some of them are getting their FS1 because they want to go and do some tubes with the friends and then go and get into free flying. And we always need to remember that when we're uh, with our students. And then the last thing is, if you think you're going to get an FS coaches rate and make loads of money, you're not. Most of the drop zones don't pay FS coaches. They're doing it out of the goodness of the heart. The odd um, drop zone will um, pay for FS coaching, but it's never going to be a money-making thing. Once you've paid for a pat job and a coffee, you, you're probably um, back to zero. Um, but they're not reasons why you shouldn't do it, but if that's why you're thinking of doing it, um, then please don't. Um, the hard bits, you do less fun jumps, especially if you're on a busy drop zone and there's not many coaches. And this is one of the reasons why I'm really passionate of getting more coaches through. There was a period of time where there was only me and one other coach on a very busy drop zone. And um, 
not that I wanted to quit it because I didn't, but I never got to jump with my friends. And sometimes you still need to do fun jumps uh, to have some fun for yourself um, and develop yourself. I mentioned before it's a lot of work. It's not just a quick brief and then off we go and jump. And also one of the hard things people struggle with, especially when they're experienced coaches, is knowing when to hand off to another coach. Sometimes you're not going to be the right coach for them. I still will pass people um, off to somebody else. And the next coach you pass them to might say exactly the same thing as you have done, but just said it in a slightly different way. And just that change, either in personality or wording, means they now get it. And that doesn't mean you're a bad coach. It just means you're doing the best thing for the student in front of you. It can be hard as well to know when to hand off to an instructor, especially if you see something like, um, if you're watching them under canopy and something's going wrong, if you're not a canopy coach, you still want to give some advice on, or you can still want to give some advice on canopy coaching, but you have to be very careful because if you're not a canopy coach, you need to understand how far you can go before you need to, to pass it off. And that can sometimes be really difficult. Um, another big thing for me is the debriefing side. A lot of people really struggle to debrief. One, because sometimes they can't see what has gone wrong. And two, it's how to handle the person, especially if the person thinks they've just smashed the level and it was a car crash. And it's how you manage to put that across and make them still want to carry on and jump again. Um, what, I've got um, one person that was, I was teaching them to become a coach. And, when, and I was practicing as the student for them. And all I did, I did the exit fine, but I just de-arched on my turn so that I popped up. That's all I did. And the debrief told me my exit was rubbish. Um, I can't skydive, I haven't got a good body position. My track was rubbish. And it made me feel about that big and like I wanted to quit. And I was the one teaching him. <laughs> and that, but that was just how he came across. And if he'd have come across like that to a, a student, they wouldn't have carried on in our sport and that isn't the isn't what we want. So it's really important for debriefing to learn how to do that properly. Um, and also, if you work in the sport, so sometimes camera flyers will do FS coaching as well, it can really be hard to get that balance between work jumps and coach jumps, especially if on the drop zone they don't pay for coach jumps. Because if you're there obviously earning money doing camera, you might want to focus on that. And all too often we see FS students um, waiting for coaching, and that can be why because it can be really hard to get that balance right. However, having said all that, it is loads of fun it, and also so rewarding. There's nothing better than seeing someone progress through their FS1, especially if they've been struggling with something and you manage to help them. It is so rewarding. And like I said, it's just the best job in the world. Your students will remember you forever. Everyone put their hands up before and said they remember who took them on their FS1. And I think that is so cool. We get them to jump with the friends and also it makes you a, a better flyer massively. If you think about it, some of the people that you will be taking last week, they, like, they were literally just qualifying, so they're not very experienced at all. You still don't know what they're gonna do in free form. Anything can happen. So um, you have to be ready and obviously you have to be able to stay with them as well. Um, so for me, I have to be able to stay with really, really light people and, and bigger, heavier people. <laughs> so, you know, it makes you a better flyer because you have to be able to do that. Um, and also, it really prepares you for being an instructor if that's what you want to do. Um, at the drop zone that I'm at, we have clear lesson plans for our coaches. So they're then used to doing that. So if they go on to be AFF or whatever, they're used to briefing, used to debriefing and used to using the lesson plans. So if it is something you're considering in the future going to be an instructor, this is a great first step. Um, Let's have a look at the safety side. So, like I said before, all we're doing is giving them the appropriate skills to be able to jump with other skydivers safely. Um, we're not saying that they're amazing flyers, but they have to be able to um, check their altitude and they have to track properly. If they've done loads of tunnel and they're an absolute <coughs> ninja, but they don't track off uh, well enough or they don't ch um, check their altitude, they're not gonna get through their FS1. So it's making sure that that is a big part of it. And also, when I was thinking about the other things that I consider, when I'm thinking about just one jump, I came up with a list of 21 things that I think about on every jump with a student. And that sounds like a lot, but actually there might be more. So I'm just going to briefly go through the, the list. I won't go through them all. And then you can let me know if you think there's any others. So 
I check the logbooks or the videos, especially if I've never jumped with them before, to see where they're up to. I'll think about the plans for the day, so how many jumps are they wanting to do? Do they have to go home at lunchtime? I think about my brief, the free fall plan. I think about the canopy plan, so what are the winds doing? Should we be taking them at all? I think about manifest, so making sure I'm in control of that. A top tip, never let your student manifest. Uh, make sure you're in control of that. Kit, have they got their own kit? So have they got the right rig? Have they picked up a static line rig? Have you got the right gear on? So when I'm coaching, I've got three suits. I've got a super slow suit, a super fast suit, and then an all round suit. And I do that so that I can fly with anybody in front of me. But you also need to consider that. Calls. So not everybody is good at getting ready on a 15 minute call, especially if they're new skydivers. Some of them will need 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever. You need to understand your student. Flight line, who's doing the checks? Are you also JM? Do you need to sign something there? Boarding, do they know what order to get on the aircraft? When you're in the aircraft, what's the procedure? Are you talking to them? Are they visualising? Are they clipped in? Do they unclip themselves? All of that. Then I think about on the running, so if they put the goggles on, are they ready to skydive? Then I think about my exit. We do the jump, the free fall. I think about watching the track. Landing, so I consider where I'm going to land compared to them. Sometimes the drop zones have separate landing areas, so there'll be a student one and an experienced one. They're usually separated. They are at my drop zone. But if I'm doing coaching, I always land in the student field with my student so that I can uh, see what they're doing. That's something to consider. And then also getting back from the PLA. So sometimes they have to get a bus back. If it's the first time on your drop zone, do they understand that? The packing shed, do they know where to put the kit and what to do with it? And then I think about my debrief and writing up the log book. And when I'm thinking about my debrief, it's not only what am I going to say, but also where am I going to do it? Have I got a quiet spot to go and put them in to do it? And then thinking about how long they need for the next jump. Some people are raring to go straight away and others will need a full hour to go and get a coffee, have some more nervous wheeze or whatever before they can go back again. And sometimes you need to consider wind tunnel as well. Um, sometimes to help them get through the, the process quicker and more efficient, it's better to hand them off to a tunnel coach to go and do a little bit of tunnel and then come back on another day. So there's 21 things there I think about just on a jump, okay? And then on top of that, there's other things that I also think about, okay? So I think about learning styles. So there's four ways you can learn. People are normally learning a few, in more than one of these ways. So some people need to see things. So are we demonstrating things to them? Are we showing them videos? Some people have to listen to what you say. Other people need to think about it, so they'll need five minutes to process it before they can do it. And other people need to feel it, so getting them to, to demonstrate it. Considering, like I said, why they want FS1, so I don't just do this as in what they're going to do next, but it's how I explain why we're doing the moves. So if somebody wants to get into a big way, I will talk about that when we're doing a, a swoop to pin, or when we're doing fast and slow fall, I explain it in relation to big way. If somebody just wants to go off and just do some um, fun jumps, hoop jumps or whatever with the friends, I might change my language there because it's picking up on their motivations to make sure that they're listening to me. Has the first jump fear returned? So I had a student um, that hadn't jumped for a while. She was so scared that she was literally physically shaking in the plane. And one of the things that she wanted to do is she wanted to get out and do a couple of practice pulls. And obviously things like that, you need to allow them to do it, okay? So that might not be in your lesson plan of doing fast and slow fall, but if I hadn't, hadn't built that into my flight plan with her, she would have just panicked the whole way down. So picking up on things like that, is there something like that that somebody needs to do? And then my favorite one is that students will do exactly what you tell them, okay? Now, they will take it literally. Another quick story, one, um, one of the students I had, the week before, she'd been on the drop zone, she hadn't had a very good jump, and then I'd taken her on a jump. The jump went really well. I landed, and then I noticed she'd messed up her landing pattern. And she was coming in over the runway, and she was going to land on the runway. The only problem with that is there was a caravan um, taxiing down the runway, okay? And she was flying directly towards it, props spinning and everything. She carried on flying towards that plane, and the plane was quite a way away, but she kept flying towards it, okay? 
The pilot obviously saw her and he ended up revving up and getting off the runway, okay? And then she still landed on the runway. When we spoke to her later on, the reason she'd done that is the week before, she'd been shouted at for doing a low turn and she was told never, ever, ever do a low turn. And she thought that low turn also meant trimming away from a caravan that's flying towards you. So that was a lesson really, and I hadn't, it wasn't me that did that, it was somebody else that had said that to her. But it's just understanding that everything you say, they're gonna do literally, so really pick your words. Um, I mentioned before, you might not be the right coach for them. And then another one we come across more and more is they might have been taught to do a different method than your teaching. A good example of this is um, tunnel. So some of the tunnel instructors, if they're not skydivers and they take people in, they are teaching them to fly in the wind tunnel. They are not teaching them to fly in the sky. And sometimes the techniques that they use to do side slides or forwards, backwards, whatever it is, is not, not the techniques you would want to, to use on an FS1. Um, so it's, it's being able to articulate that. And also, um, they might have been told a different method from a different coach. Now, there's a million ways you can do everything. I could teach you to turn several different ways, forwards and backwards. There's a load of ways to do it. There's no right or wrong answer. It's what works for them. So on your lesson plan, it might say that we're going to do a turn a certain way. But if they've already been turned, taught a different method and it's working, crack on with that. Never, ever say that another coach is wrong because they're not. There's just a million ways to do something but it's just to really bear that in mind you need to bear in mind cameras as well on the drop zone i jump at it's mandatory to have a camera on for a coach jump and um, not all drop zones will have that rule but obviously it's a really good um debriefing tool if you are wearing one please make sure you signed off to jump it and your ci knows exactly what you are doing um, and then signals i mentioned before it is super difficult to give signals in the sky so that somebody understands you clearly so i would practice that and um, but also the other thing on signals is you can make up whatever signal you want okay it like i said it's not just all all about arching and legs out i have one where i tap my head so if i say to somebody stop and i tap my head that is me telling them to reset into a neutral position and when, what I mean by neutral is I want them to think about where the hips are, where their arms are and where the legs are. Because it's usually one of those three things that will fix an unstable body position. It's quicker for me to get them to reset than me go through, through three lots of hand signals. And also the more they reset themselves, the quicker it will become muscle memory. And I just wanted to share that with you because when people first started seeing me tap my head, they thought I was going like, what are you doing? But you can have whatever signals you want. And sometimes um, a student will do something you've never seen before and you need to improvise of how to communicate in the sky. So, you know, if they, they've got one wonky leg or something, how do you get that across in free fall? But if you are going to make a signal up, make sure be before you go up they know what it is. Don't just start tapping your head in free fall and them not have a clue what you're trying to say. Um, and then one of the most important things as well, if you are doing a three-way, not everyone does that, but uh, and a four-way, consider who the other people on the jump are. Don't just get anybody from the drop zone to come and jump on it. <coughs> you want to give them the best chance as possible of passing that jump. Sometimes that jump is super expensive. If they're paying for three slots plus a coaching fee, which on some drop zones they will, um, there's a lot of pressure on them and you need to make sure that those people aren't going to mess the jump up. Where possible, I will try to, if it's somebody I've been working with, I will um, do it for them and put my own slot in. Because when I was doing it, people did that for me. And I know a lot of the drop zones, and um, that is the case as well. But even if it's a freebie, you still need somebody that you know is going to help the jump and not hinder it for the student. And also thinking about, you don't know the answer to everything. Don't lie. If you don't know the answer to something, go and find out, then try to make something up. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider, eh? 21 things just on a jump and then all the other bits. Um, so like I said, it isn't as easy as people think. Um, so as long as I've not put you off and some of you are still inspired to become a coach, um, some of the top tips of if you're considering being a coach um, is currency. Make sure you are current on your belly. It's no good going off doing a season of uh, free fly with a team not jumping for months and months and then deciding you're going to go back to coaching. Make sure you've done some belly jumps beforehand. Get back current. 
help out if there's other coaches jump on the three and four ways do as much as you can and keep getting coaching yourself like i say techniques change and actually you can get better and better and the more coaching you get the more you'll pick up of different ways to say things different way to handle um, people things like that I always say to everyone, if my coaches are still getting coaching, which they are, and they are multiple world champions, then everybody in this room, there's still a place for coaching. So please never, ever stop getting coaching. Listen to others. So if, if there's somebody else doing a debrief or other coaches on site, whether it's belly or free fly or whatever, just listen to what coaches are saying. See what you can pick up. Never forget what it was like in the early days. We were all on our FS1 at one point. We were all brand new jumpers. And just um, being able to empathise with someone who's maybe a little bit nervous or struggling to learn something is key. Um, make sure you're adaptable. Like I say, not everybody um, learns the same way or needs, needs the same thing from a coach. And then again, like I say, everyone's motivation is different. So having said all that, like I said, being a coach is, the, is what I think is one of the best jobs in the, on the drop zone. But it can lead to so many things. So it can lead to becoming an instructor. Like I say, it's a really good foundation for that because of the briefs and the lesson plans. Um, it can lead to being, um, if you fancy getting into coaching four-way. Again, coaching four-way is something I'm really passionate about. That has its own challenges and that is another massive learning curve because obviously you've got four slots there to learn and you've got to learn how to manage a team, not just a single person. But again, that's something that FS Coaching will really lead into. You can become a load organiser and you can have loads of fun like this. He wasn't supposed to be in that orientation. <laughs> but um, yeah, load organising is another great thing. Um, and then also there's the IBA um, tunnel coach rating as well. So um, in the tunnels, if you don't know, they've recently changed uh, this year for iFly, um, who can coach in the tunnel. But it's really good because you can now go on a course to learn how to be a coach. And again, um, whether you do that separately to FS coaching or just the wind tunnel, um, they're two different skills, but they work so well alongside each other. And then lastly, like I say, if you are interested in being an FS coach, and please, I hope some of you do, um, do as much as you can to observe other coaches. Go onto the website and familiarise yourself with the British Skydiving manuals or your own drop zones, because some drop zones do have their own. Watch as many um, videos and debriefs as you can. Watch videos of your own skydives and see if you can pick up what you would change. Or can you see how to make somebody side slide? Or if somebody isn't turning well, what is going wrong? See if you can pick it up. And if you can't, get a, co a coach to look at it to tell you what to look out for. Um, and practice. So either practice with somebody like me and have them be your student. Um, I love doing it. It's loads of fun. So I'm sure you'll be able to find somebody to do it. Uh, or go and practice with your friends. Jump with them. Get them to do something. See if you can pick it up. See if you can see how to fix it. Um, and then see if you can give hand signals. Practice the hand signals. You can also do some practice in the tunnel as well. Um, I do some of these sometimes where I'll do a day of taking people in the tunnel. So again, so that I'm the student. So they're practicing the full thing, the brief and the, the free fall without all the rigmarole of everything else. Um, and learn to coach, not just to fly. It's not just about how you do the movements. It's about how you coach someone. So uh, most people in here will probably, probably be able to tell me how to go forwards or backwards. Um, but it's whether you can actually articulate that to someone. The best one is when I'm starting with someone and I ask them how they turn left. People don't know how they turn left because you just turn, don't you? But you have to know, and you have to know how to articulate it to someone. Um, and get as much knowledge as you can. The more knowledge you can fill yourself with, either on the mechanisms of how to do something, um, how to coach in general, so whether that is related to skydiving or something in your work life, Anything like that can be translated to FS coaching, but just get as much knowledge as you can. So basically, I just wanted to run through um, the, the good things about FS coaching and the realities of FS coaching, the things that aren't so good about it and the things that are amazing about it. Um, and like I said, I think it is the best job in the world. There's nothing better than awarding somebody their FS1 and then going off seeing them, either going doing a tube with the friends and having the best time ever, 
or seeing them on a medal podium because they've done the first rookie competition and they've got a medal. Like, honestly, it is the best job in the world. So if I can inspire just one person in this room, I will be so happy. So who did we say is working towards the coaches rating now? Coach, who's working towards the coaches rating? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Amazing, six, perfect. So yeah, so that's um, basically um, everything about FS coaching. Although I could talk to you all day um, about it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pete Stone, I've been a coach uh, four years ago. My coach rating lapsed, lapsed. I was an FS coach for 26 years before that. Yeah. And all I want to say is, Kath, what you've said is absolutely spot on. It really is a really good presentation. Thank you. Just one thing that I might add to the things to think about. Yeah. When I got my coach's rating, in 1992, yeah. um, we, I was at the Royal Marines Club at Dunkersville, <clears throat> and we were, I was coaching a mixture of both military guys and um, civilian people. And one of the things you're saying is consideration. And what I found very quickly was that the military guys were much more receptive to coaching than the civilians. Oh, really? And I thought, well, why is this? Why is it? And then, of course, it came to me that, that they'd, they'd done their basic training. They'd learned that if they don't do what they're told, that it's painful. Well, skydiving is fun. We don't want to give people pain. Um, so you have to be aware that in finding out about people, one of the things I discovered is that um, if you get uh, the, things, the things to consider, if you start talking to them before you even do your first jump and you find out what they do when they're not skydiving, and I found a very high correlation between people who play an organized sport, whether it's tennis or, or, or football or rugby or hockey, uh, and people who don't, that those people who play an organised sport before they come into skydiving tend to be much more receptive to coaching. So it's another thing about finding out about your potential student. You know, what, what else do you do when you're not jumping, you know, over that cup of coffee? And it's really, really useful. And then my final thing is, if I, I hope I don't want to be boring you, my final thing is on, on your um, business about the, you, 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 were de you de-arched, and your student, who was going to be the coach, yeah. said to you, you did that all wrong. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I learned a very, very great, great technique from the, um, the inimitable Dan Brodsky Chenfield. He said, Peter, don't tell people what you don't want them to do. Tell them what you want them to do. Yeah. So he should have said to you, Kath, look at your body position. I think you're a bit de arched there. Can you work harder and push your chest forward and push your hips forward and get a really hard arch on for me? Thank you so much. That's amazing what you say about the military. Like, my perception would be, be the other way around, but I can see why. That's really good. Any other questions or comments? No, perfect. Well, listen. Oh, oh. Hi, Kath. Uh, I just wonder if you're doing another course for coaching coaches at Hitherslow this year, and will you phone me first to make sure I'm not working that weekend <laughs> this time? <laughs> I know poor Phil, probably the last three courses we've done, I think you've, we've done it on the day you're working, aren't you? Um, yes, we're planning to run two this year. Um, there'll be one maybe March time-ish. I'm just confirming dates with the drop zone and then September or October. Yeah, but there's a few other things that are going in around that. So, but yeah, I'll let you know. Um, and also um, tunnel nights as well. Um, with iFly, we're probably going to do two. The ones we do in the tunnel aren't for to become an IBA tunnel coach. They're a separate course, but we can do um, tunnel courses to be a, a sky coach. If that makes sense. Yeah. Any others? Hey. Um, how long does it normally take to become um, an FS coach? Oh, and what's the criteria? What kind of things do you have to do? Yeah. Good question. So. Each drop zone is slightly different to um, what they want you to go through to become a, an FS coach. In some of the drop zones where they maybe don't have um, somebody dedicated to looking after it or whatever, sometimes if somebody's a really good flyer, they've done a little bit of coaching, helping out, sometimes they'll just get them to do a few jumps and then that's it, you can have a coach's rating. The drop zone that I'm at, we do courses for people, um, but it doesn't mean that you get your rating straight away. So we do a lot of the things we've talked about today, a lot of learning the mechanisms, how to teach, a lot of the ground stuff. Then practice jumps, a little bit like beat up jumps for AFF. 
um, and then only then when they're able to articulate all the levels um, as in explaining how to do the mechanisms we're happy that they communicate with the, in the sky and they do qualify and jump so they'll do one with me and then they'll do one with an advanced instructor they'll then get the rating when I did mine it took me a full three months of being there every weekend to get it um, if any of you know Stu Ferguson he's the one who got me my uh, coaches rated and I did swear in my helmet several times because when he was a student he was yeah he was pretty tough um, I don't think it with people that I do it with it's not necessarily three three months of, of every weekend I like to see people dedicated to it so I would normally have them come on on the course that we do which is a two-day thing and then they can go away and practice learn and then they just come back and do the qualifying jumps so it depends on the person as well. Some people have smashed it through, they've done the course and then straight away um, passed it. And then others, it's taken quite a few months. I've had somebody take over a year as well, but that's because they didn't go and do the homework. They didn't go and learn how to teach the, the lessons and, and things like that. Um, and it does just depend on the, on the drop zone and the, the person. But a super good question, thank you. No, perfect. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming to listen about FS Coaching. And if any of you have got any questions or you want to learn to become a coach, please come and see me because uh, I'll be hanging around. So thank you.